Hello my dear students, today we are going to record for A Hanging by Eric Arthur Blair, also known as George Orwell. So this chapter comes in the ideology module of your text on introduction to literature. So literature is also part of ideology. Literature itself is an ideology. Literature, your college syllabus, Sahitya, so to speak, serves the dominant ideology. Let's look at the ways in which literature is implicated in ideology. George Orwell was born in 1903 in Motihari in what is today Bengal. So he was born in British India. He served as a colonial officer in Burma, what is today Myanmar, which also used to be a colony of Britain. It was part of the British Empire. So George Orwell is well known for his uh, masterpieces such as the allegory, Animal Farm. It's an allegory, Anyavadeshagatha, and also the dystopian science fiction novel 1984. It's a very famous dystopian novel. All of us know of terms like Big Brother is watching you or Thought Crime or Big Speak. These are all terms that we have derived from George Orwell's extremely crucial intervention into the ideology of totalitarianism in the 20th century, uh, namely 1984. That's why George Orwell is one of the most important thinkers and writers and novelists of the 20th century. He critically examined the idea of totalitarianism, the very idea of reason in the 20th century. He himself was uh, a person who participated in the Republican war against the fascist regime of Frederick of Franco in Spain. So his experiences during that war are chronicled in Homage to Catalonia. So he was in Barcelona. He and his wife Orwell and his wife Aileen were part of the Republican resistance against the fascist regime of Frederico Franco. And he was wounded and uh, uh, he was relieved from the forces, Republican forces. So George Orwell is a legendary figure. So George Orwell also wrote this uh, tremendously powerful uh, work called Out to Vegan Peer, where he brought out uh, the issue of uh, poverty in Britain, where he uh, convinced many people that the poor people also have feelings, they also have love, sorrow and sadness. Look at that mother holding uh, her child in uh, the, over the in those dwellings. She also loves her child. She also feels sorry for her child whom she cannot feed. So these people, these poor people, these outcasts who live on the margins of our society, they also have lives, they also have emotions, they are humans of flesh and blood. These are the emotions that George Orwell helped induce in the English their classes during the 20th century through his writings, especially the auto vegan peer. Also he has written some very important and entertaining novels such as Keep the Aspidistra Flying. Uh, it's about a man who wants to escape from middle class mediocrity, but it uh, calls him back into that very mediocre, middle class mediocrity. And also, he has written other very important novels. Uh, Down and Out in Paris and London is his uh, narrative of uh, tramping in uh, London and uh, Paris, two of the most important cities in the world at that time, two colonial centers, but they were also extremely horrible places for the Poor, especially the urban poor. So urban poverty was a uh, terrific topic that George Orwell examined so well in his essays and stories and novels. And also he also dealt into the uh, heart of totalitarianism, Swetchadivati in 20th century. And also the issue of colonialism is precipitated in many of his uh, works. So colonialism, he also wrote a very major novel called Burmese Days. It's about a colonial British officer who is kind of uh, betrayed by his Burmese wife, Myanmar's wife. So that colonial ideology of George Orwell and the colonial ideology is the unconscious. Okay. So between George Orwell and between George Orwell and the Indian or between George Orwell and the Burmese person, there is an abyss. Our Kedale, there is an ocean. That ocean is unconscious the unconscious as the ideology of the colonial british state okay so let's go into george orwell's a hanging 
It was in Burma, a certain morning of the rains. It was a monsoon morning, a rainy morning in Burma. A sickly light, a sick light, a yellow sick light was slanting over the high walls into the jail yard. A sickly light, an unhealthy light, a feeble light which was yellow in color, which was yellow like the tin foil of a cigarette packet, was slanting over the extremely high protective walls of the jail into the courtyard of the jail. It was coming inside the jail like an interloper. We were waiting outside the quantum cells. The quantum cells are the cells meant for people who are going to be executed for various crimes. And Orwell and other British and Myanmarese Burmese officials were waiting outside these cells that were meant for these uh, quantum people, those people who are about to die. Okay, uh, a row of sheds fronted with double bars, like small animal cages. So these people, uh, these unfortunate, unlucky, miserable people were being held in animal-like cages. These were cages that were suitable not for human beings, but suitable for animals. Each cell was like uh, 10 feet long and 10 feet broad. Okay. So they only had a plank bed for furniture and also a pot of drinking water. So these were very depressing places. In some of them, brown Indian or Burmese men were squatting, were squatting at the inner bars. They were squatting in the inner bars of these cages with their blankets draped around them. So it was monsoon, so it was raining and it was cold in the morning. So many of these contempt people who were about to be killed were uh, draping their blankets around them to save themselves, their bare bodies from the cold. So many of these men were bare bodied, mostly unclad. Okay. They were wearing some kind of a loin cloth, but apart from that, they were bare bodied. These were the contempt men due to be hanged within the next day, week or two. These people would be executed, hanged in seven days or 14 days at most. So they were squatting. So Indians were called the great squatting people. We were squatting. Okay, that's how we defeated the English. We squatted. Okay, we squatted before the might of the great British Empire. So squatting is an ideology. Squatting is an act. So ideology is a performance. So everything is ideology. You can never escape ideology. If you tell me that you exist outside a particular ideology, that also is an ideology. So beware. Not just the English police officers in this particular essay, but Orwell himself is part of an ideology. He's a British serving officer with some sensitivity, with some sensibility, with some humanism in him. But he is also part of that ideology, a particular ideology, which is more conversational, which is more confrontational, which is more like rational and uh, debating kind of uh, enlightened consciousness but that consciousness is also part of a certain kind of ideology of the enlightenment in europe one prisoner had been brought out of his cell he was a hindu a puny wisp of a man with a shaven head and vague liquid eyes this was a small little man they were going to hang he had a thick starting moustache, absurdly too big for his body, rather like the moustache of a comic man on the films. This was a small man with a big moustache. So you must have seen Amir Khan playing the role of the great Mangal Pandey. So a short man with a huge moustache. It looked almost comical, but not comical. Okay. Six tall Indian warders were guarding him and getting him ready for the gallows. Okay, this was an Indian man who was being led to the gallows, the Karimaram, who were leading him. Indian warders, not British men, Indians were leading. What was the ideology of those Indians? Look at that. They were also being interpolated into the ideology of the empire. They were also serving the British empire, the empire where the sun never set. They were also singing praises to the British queen or the king. So they were also serving a particular ideology, no matter whether they were Indians or Burmese or Myanmarese. Okay. So the difference lies not in the color of our skin or our race, but in the ideology that we serve. They all served the same ideology. Let's look at Adur Gopalakrishnan's very famous masterpiece, Nirankutta, which also 
chronicles the narrative of an execution. Just look at it carefully. Here an executioner, executioner is going to be intimated of an impending execution by a messenger from the king himself, from the monarch himself. Okay. So Jagati here is playing the messenger from the king who has arrived to intimate the executioner uh, played by Udhuvan Unikrishnan that there is an impending execution and he is expected to uh, carry out that execution. So Odeville is the executioner. He has no interest in the execution. He is just drinking some kind of liquor toward your arak. So it's the system that makes you execute a person. It's not the individual itself that is important. There is a much wider system. There is a machine. There is the administrative yantra or the machine that is grinding, that is killing people, that exerts its power by taking someone's life because power is sovereign. Sovereign power is the power over life monarch a king or a queen is someone who has power over your life like people like henry the eighth had amply proven so let's go back to our lesson uh, the indian borders are carrying this prisoner away they crowded very close about him so that he won't escape they lashed his arms tight to his sides they tied his arms to his sides so with the arms uh, always on him in a careful caressing grip it was almost as if they were caressing him, as if it would hurt him if they were too forceful in their grip. And so all the while feeling him to make sure he was there. It was as if they were touching him to make sure that he existed, he was there. It was like men handling a fish which is still alive and may jump back into the water. Like a fisherman would handle nimbly handle a fish so that it won't jump back into the water. Similarly, they were holding him as if they were before the well springs of life and this man would jump back into the well springs of life. They were holding his life in their hands. But he stood quite unresisting, yielding his arms limply to the ropes as though he hardly noticed what was happening. And this man was not offering any kind of resistance whatsoever. He was totally resigned to his fate. He was resigned to his fate. He was yielding himself. To whatever was being done to him. Let us kill me or eat me, whatever. Eight o'clock struck and a bugle call, desolately thin in the wet air, floated from the distant barracks. So the chimes of a bell and a bugle call floated in from the distance in the air. The superintendent of the jail, the jail superintendent, who is a white British man, a police officer and a doctor, raised his stick, raised his head, at the sound, at the gong, at the bugle, and he shouted in a gruffy voice, For God's sake, hurry up, Francis, he said irritably. The man ought to have been dead by this time. Aren't you ready yet? So he was like very angry because it was a daily chore for him. It was something to be gotten over with. A bloody dreadful job they had to do. Because they were supposed to do. They were just functionaries of the British monarch. They were just officers. They were not responsible for this murder, but they were just performing their duties, which was the very same thing the uh, Germans who were responsible for the Holocaust also used as their justification or attempted to use as their justification, that they were simply following orders, which of course doesn't wash, which is no kind of excuse whatsoever for the horrific atrocities that they committed. Francis, the head jailer, a fat dravidian in a white drill suit and gold spectacles, waved his black hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He bubbled. So, there's a South Indian person. His name is Francis. He also impersonates a certain ideology. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir is an ideology. No, sir is another ideology. So, Francis belongs to the yes, sir school of ideology. Okay. 
So he is a person who consents to the British government in India. So his consent has been generated or forcefully extracted from him. So Francis is a person who obviously supports the British government and empire. He is a functionary of the empire. He is a head jailer who, so, who exemplifies, who embodies the very ideology of the British empire in India and all over the world. So his English is not even proper English. It's somewhat like a pigeon. Then also Orwell is kind of precipitating the ideology of the Indian functionary of the British Empire. So the British Empire operated in India not owing to the greatness, not owing to the greatness or quality of its white officers, but owing to the complacence, complicity, complacence of its Indian officers like Mr. Francis. So he says, all is satisfactorily prepared. The hangman is waiting. We shall proceed. Let's go for the hanging. He wants to please his master, of course. Well, keep march then. The prisoners can't get their breakfast till this bloody job is over. We set out for the gallows. They walk to the Karimaram. Orwell, Francis, the superintendent and all of them marched towards the gallows. Two warders marched on either side of the prisoner. So the prisoner was being pushed and also being carried between two officers, two policemen. So the rest of us, magistrates and the like, the law enforcement and legal officers, the magistrates and the so-called uh, civilization followed behind. Suddenly when we had gone 10 yards, the procession stopped. So after they had gone 10 yards, that's around like 30 feet, the procession stopped short without any order or warning. Something untoward had happened. Something unexpected happened. It's a wonderful moment in this essay. This is an essay. This event is supposed to have happened. So if Orwell has any kind of credibility as a writer, at least 90% of these things must have happened during his days as a colonial administrator in Burma. A dog came out of nowhere, had appeared in the yard. It came bounding among us with a loud volley of barks and started yelping. Bow, bow, and leapt around us, wagging its whole body. This animal was not attacking them. It was wild with happiness at finding so many human beings. It was so happy because it had found so many masters, so many nice gentlemen in a fine morning. It was a large woolly dog, half Airedale, half. It was a half-breed dog. So here also there is ideology at work. In Orwell's use of a particular taboo word, you can find ideology. He uses a cast name in a derogatory manner for an animal. Here you find Orwell's ideology. Orwell has no sensitivity to the kind of people whom he were ruling in India or in Burma. That is evident. Orwell was a great man. He was a great writer. He was a great revolutionary who went and fought on the Republican side. He was a great man who wrote the allegory Animal Farm. He was a man who wrote the dystopian science fiction 1984. But in his word of that P word here, you can find Orwell's insensitivity. His lack of sensibility can be found in that particular word. You can find Orwell himself is implicated in a particular ideology of superiority, of control, of power, of being elite, the elitist ideology, the controlling ideology, the ideology of holier than thou, of the English elites can be found in his terminology. So great scholars like Gopal Guru would say that ideology or caste consists in the kind of language that we use. Okay. For a moment it pranced around us. The dog pranced around this man. Then it made a dash for the prisoner and jumped up trying to lick his face. The dog started expressing its affection for this pure, uh, this, uh, this pure affection for this condemned person. Everyone stood aghast. They were all taken aback. Oh my God, what's happening? This dog is licking the face of a content man who is about to be killed. Who let that bloody brute in here? Said the superintendent angrily. Catch it, someone. A warder detached from the escort charged clumsily after the dog. But it danced and gambled just out of its reach, taking everything as part of the game. So the dog was just having fun. It was just jumping around, gambling around, running around. So even though a warder tried to obey the British superintendent, tried to catch the dog, it 
who did not come to anything. A young Eurasian jailer picked up a handful of gravel and tried to storm the dog away. The Eurasian person, uh, the mixer trace uh, jailer, tried to they pick up some stones and uh, and throw them at the dog to chase it away. But the dog expertly dodged the stones and came after them again. It escapes these volleys of stones and it came back at them, not attacking them, but wanted to join them. Its yaps echoed from the jail waves. Uh, so, from the jail walls, its yaps echoed. Yap, yap, yap. So, the dog was yapping and these yaps, the sounds the animal made, was reverberating. The prisoner, in the grasp of the two wardens, looked on incuriously. He was nonchalant. He didn't care about this uh, scenario that was going around him. He did not care at all about this melodrama that was happening, unveiling around him. As though this was another formality of the hanging. The prisoner thought that this was just another formality. These British colonial administrators have to take me through before they execute me. It was several minutes before someone managed to catch the dog. At last, someone caught the dog and they put Orwell's handkerchief through its collar. The dog had a collar. So, uh, so maybe it was, perhaps it was somebody's dog and it was owned by someone. Perhaps a British colonial officer's pet dog. And Orwell put his handkerchief threw in the dog collar and he restrained the dog in such a fashion. It was about 40 yards to the gallows. It was around 120 feet to the perimeter of the gallows. I watched the bare brown back of the prisoner. He was almost nude. He was just wearing, uh, you know, minimal clothes. He walked clumsily with his bound arms. His arms were tied up and his hands were tied to his torso, but he was walking steadily. But his knees were not straightening. So, Orwell calls this the typical bobbing gait of the Indian. Here also, there is the colonial ideology of power. Power is an ideology, okay? The ideology that makes you say, yes, sir. Gandhi said, no, sir. But some other people bent their knees and said, yes, sir. So these prisoners' uh, knees were not straightening, according to Orwell. We don't know whether he is reliable here. At each step, his muscles slid neatly into his place. His muscles were perfectly fine, working like a machine. The lock of hair on his scalp, on his head, was dancing up and down. He had a sort of kuduma, which was jumping up and down. His feet printed themselves on the wet gravel. His barefooted prints were impressing themselves upon the wet gravel that was on the floor. And once, in spite of the man who gripped him by each shoulder, he stepped slightly aside to avoid a puddle on the path. This is a very important and poignant moment in the essay. So these two Indian warders were gripping him uh, by his shoulders, but at some point he tried to step slightly around a puddle of mud on the path. He didn't want to step in the puddle of dirty water. He wanted to protect himself, his body. This comes instinctually to any human being or even animal to protect itself, to protect himself or herself against this uh, Dirt. Okay, so it is curious, but till that moment, I had never realized what it means to destroy a healthy conscious man. So this moment precipitated the thought in George Orwell that this man, he and his colleagues were about to execute, was a human being in flesh and blood. He also had a brain. He also had a body. He also had a soul. He also had the instinct to protect himself from dirt. When I saw the prisoner step aside to avoid the puddle, I saw the mystery. The unspeakable wrongness of cutting a life short when it is in full tide. So this was a man at the height of his powers. His body was strong, his mind was strong, his will was strong, his instinct was full functioning. So this man was not dying, he was alive. Like you and me are alive. All his organs were working, his bowels were digesting his food, his skin was functioning perfectly well, healthy skin, renewing itself with vitamin E and vitamin D from sunlight. His nails were growing every day, even in sleep. Tissues were forming, all toiling away in solemn foolery, all for nothing. Anyway, we are all going to die. His nails would still be growing when he stood on the drop. When they made him stand on that pedestal to get him, his nails would still be growing. Because he's a human. He's a human who instinctually would step around a puddle of dirty water. 
when he was falling through the air with a tenth of a second to live, his eyes saw the yellow gravel and the grey walls, and his brain still remembered for so recent, recent even about about puddles. He had a brain that reasoned that he must step around dirty water, and in that one by tenth of a second that he would live between the drop and the fall, then his nails would grow in that infinitesimal section of time, segment of time. He and we were a party of men walking together. Orwell and his quantum man, his unnamed, this nameless man, they were both together, a seeing, hearing, feeling, understanding, protoplasmic, pulsating whole, an adduidic whole. They were all part of the world. They were all in it together and they were going to kill one part of that whole in two minutes with a sudden snap of the vertebra. One of them would be gone. One mindless, one world less, almost as if in Bashir's other condemnation. Niyam nyanam enna yatha tithilamun ni matram baki agamun ni matram agamun. So almost like this, almost like a, almost like a short love poem. Okay, almost like a prose poem of love. Almost, almost, no, totally. So literature is ideology at its purest. The gallows stood in a small yard. Gallows stood in a small courtyard. It is a brick erection, but of jungle age, diga. Like three sides of a shed. It had three sides to hide the dead body. It had three sides with planking on top. So the man was made to stand on top of this shed, three sided edifice. And above that, two beams and a crossbar. Above that planking, there were two beams. And on top was a crossbar. And the crossbar had a rope dangling. The collector, the hangman, a grey haired convict. The Arachar was also a very old man in white uniform of the prison waiting beside his machine. He was in charge of uh, this Yamadharma. He had to kill this man. He greeted us with a servile crouch as we entered. Uh, with a very ugly, with a very dirty uh, kind of gesture of servility, of being a servant, of being a subordinate, of being a slave. He greeted them. Okay, with an abject gesture of servility. He crouched, he bent his back as were nothing before his colonial masters. At a word from Francis, the two warders gripping the prisoner more closely than ever, half led, half pushed into the gallows. So Francis called out to the two warders and at his orders, the two warders who were holding the prisoner between them, half led and half pushed him into the gallows. So they were a bit brutal, even with a man who was about to be executed. So they helped him clumsily up the ladder. So he had to climb a ladder to get upon the scaffolding. They pushed him up the ladder. Then the hangman climbed up and fixed the rope around the prisoner's neck. Then the arachar climbed up the ladder and he then fixed the rope, the collar around the prisoner's neck. He stood waiting five yards away. Almost 60 feet away, who was waiting? George Orwell and the other dignitaries were waiting to witness this great event of execution. The warders had formed in a rough circle round the gallows. And then, when the news was fixed, the prisoner began crying out on his god. It was a high reiterated cry of ram, 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 ram. The man started praying. Not fearful, he was not afraid. And he was not in a panic, but he was uttering a prayer or a cry. He was uttering a prayer, not a cry, but steadily, rhythmically, like the tolling of a bell. Like a money miracle, he was like praying to God. The dog answered the sound with a whine. The hangman, still standing on the gallows, produced a small cotton bag, like a flower bag, and drew it down over the prisoner's face. He covered the prisoner's face with a bag, but still through that bag, his chanting, his prayer to the Lord came through. It could be heard still, ram, 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 ram. The hangman climbed down and stood ready, holding the lever. He stood at attention, ready to pull the lever and carry out his duty. It's a kind of performance, right? Minutes seemed to pass. Seconds ticked away. The steady, muffled crying from the prisoner went on and on. The chanting, ram, ram, ram. Never faltering for an instant. It did not relent even for one microsecond. He was praying. His chanting went on. The superintendent, his head on his chest. He was hanging his head, head so that his chin touched his chest as if in shame. He slowly poked the ground with his stick. Perhaps he was counting the cries. Maybe he was counting the cries. Okay, one cry, two cry, three cry. So let's go 
uh, let's let him go till 50 or maybe let him go till 100. Was it what he was counting? Perhaps you would never know. Everyone had changed color. People had changed. The, their complexions were totally different right now from uh, blanching. They were all blanched. They were all terribly embarrassed. They were all horrified by, by the horrible act that they were about to carry out. The Indians had gone gray like bad coffee. So the dark skinned, in, the darker skinned Indians had coffee complexion and uh, their bayonets, the knives attached to their guns were kind of shivering, wavering, trembling. They looked at the lashed, hooded man on the drop and listened to his cries. He was still praying. Each cry, another second of life. They couldn't kill him while he was praying, right? So each prayer was prolonging his life by one second. The same thought was in all our minds. We were all thinking together, what? Oh, kill him quickly. Get it over. Stop that abominable noise. It was unbearable. This was unbearable. Even for the British colonial officers, even for these heartless policemen and law enforcement people, it was unbearable. They simply could not stand this. This man, they were all men. Okay, there were no women present, but they could not stomach this. Even these were brutal men, but they could not stomach this. So, the uh, ideology of colonialism has two parts. It has ideological state apparatus, like culture, writing, Shakespeare, Milton, English literature, civilization, Homer, Socrates. It also has repressive state apparatus, like the hangman, like execution, like the police, like the law enforcement, like the district magistrate. It has a repressive state apparatus and it also has an ideological state apparatus. So Orwell, of course, is part of the ideological state apparatus. Orwell's writing, his reason, his consciousness, his argumentation, his articulation is, of course, part of the ideological state apparatus. But on the other hand, there is this power of the colonial state, okay, that is part of the repressive state apparatus. Let's uh, just watch Adorser's uh, masterpiece for a moment and then come back again to this chapter so you would understand this dichotomy this twin nature of ideology which comprises ideological state apparatus as well as repressive state apparatus. Colonial ideology comprises these two parts, okay, which is very, very, very crucial for me, okay. So, Odeville here is the unwilling executioner, Arachar. This man is ideology at his purest, He's announcing the impending execution to the hangman. It's not for the people, it's for the benefit of the hangman, so that he would know. It's a kind of communication, kind of early modern communication mechanism between the monarch and his functionary, the hangman, the unwilling hangman who lives in a village. Okay, so he's unwilling, see. His posture is not too eager to carry out this particular dastardly act of hanging. He is praying for himself to be excused from that terrible position. So same goes for uh, Orwell. Orwell is exactly in Orwell's position in this particular essay. Suddenly the superintendent made up his noise, made up his mind. Throwing up his head, he made a swift motion with his stick. Hello, he shouted almost fiercely. He uttered a kind of uh, noise. And he said in Hindi, Hindustani, Chalo, let's do it. There is a clanking noise. There is the sound of the lever being pulled and then dead silence. Then everything dropped dead. There was a funereal silence all around them. The prisoner had vanished, had fallen underneath the planks into the a kind of uh, shed below. So uh, the prisoner had vanished and the rope was twisting on itself. He was like a kind of, you know, uh, a throbbing. His death is writhing and it is death throes. It was like, uh, you know, the uh, twisting the rope. So, so horrible and uh, macabre. Okay, so macabre is the word for this. So, uh, all were let go of the dog and the dog galloped to the back of the gallows where the dog could see the man dying. So, the dog has a perspective that is not offered to the humans here. The dog was the actual live witness to the 
man die. None of the men were witnessing the death because it was hidden by these three sides of the brick. But when it got there, it stopped short, bumped, and then retreated into a corner of the yard where it stood among the weeds, looking timorously out at us. The dog was, you know, the dog was, you know, unspeakably, you know, traumatized by, by what it saw. So uh, there are no words for what the dog saw. We went around the gallows to inspect the prisoner's body. So once it was over, once the trampling had stopped, Orwell and his colleagues went behind to see what the dog was saying. The man, he was dangling with his toes pointed straight downwards. His toes were looking earthward, like antenna, like roots. They were slowly revolving. Okay, they were circling. As dead as his tongue, the man was dead. It's not alive, that which was clear. The superintendent reached out with his stick and poked the bare body. He poked at the body. See how insensitive the brutal man is. He poked the dead body with his stick, which oscillated like the pendulum of a clock. He's all right, he said. He backed out from under the gallows. He moved himself away and blew out a deep breath. Phew! And the moody look had gone. Everyone had suddenly become happy. Eight minutes past eight? Well, that's all for this morning. Thank God. So he utters a kind of expletive. He swears, in fact. I'm not sure whether he's thanking God or swearing or emitting an expletive. The warders unfixed bayonets and marched away. The Indian warders marched away, unfixing the knives from their, the bayonets from their guns, the, from their, uh, you know, rifles. The dog, sobered and conscious of having misbehaved itself, slipped after them. It slinkingly went after the uh, warders. We walked out of the gallows yard, past the quantum cells with the waiting prisoners, into the big central yard, the prison. So there's a tripartite structure. So there is a big central yard and within that is the quantum people cell and within that there is the execution yard. So they moved out from the execution yard into the quantum prisoner's yard and then into the wider courtyard of the prison. The convicts under the command of warders armed with lattes were already receiving their breakfast. They were eating in long rows. They were dining. They were having their breakfast. They were being served their breakfast of some meager rice on tin plates, tin pans, not pans but small Pans, panicans. It's called panicans. It did panicans, not even a proper pan. They're being fed from panicans. Uh, so, someone was ladling out a rice into these panicans. So, it looked like a quite friendly, happy, jolly scene. Okay, after the hanging, everyone was happily having their meals, reiterating their faith in life. An enormous relief had come upon us now that the job was done. It was all over. It was done and all of it. Uh, one felt an impulse to sing, to break into a run, to snigger. They felt all these things at once. Uh, all at once, everyone began chattering gaily. People started speaking of various things at once. The Eurasian boy, the other warden, walking beside Orwell, came towards Orwell and told him with a knowing smile, Do you know, sir, our friend, the deceased man, the Burmese the man who had he just been killed in the Burmese prison. When he heard his appeal had been dismissed, he pissed on the floor of his cell. So the unfortunate, the poor man, apparently, according to this person, had urinated on his cell floor uh, th that moment when he came to know that his appeal to a higher court, Supreme Court, or perhaps High Court, had been rejected and he was about to die from fright, from fear of losing his life. What else? And so according to this very brutal border, uh, his ideology is an inhuman ideology. It is colonial ideology at its purest. He is part of the repressive state apparatus. And he also asks uh, Orwell to take one of his cigarettes. He also very kindly offers Orwell, Sir, please take my cigarette, sir. Do you not admire my new silver case, sir? From the Volkswagen, two rupees, eight and as classy European style, sir. So he has a very beautiful case to hold his cigars, which, uh, cigarettes, which he had bought from some local uh, vendor of knickknacks, and it, it had cost two rupees and eight annas, and he still remembers the cost. And uh, what uh, makes him admire it so much is his classy European style. So here also Orwell is extremely judgmental, and he's stereotyping the mixed race officer because he's a Eurasian, he's half European and half Indian. So that's why Orwell is also a bit brutal on him, cruel on him. So Orwell is almost pulling his leg for wanting to be like a European. So. There you can you know, see Orwell's ideology being precipitated. Here you have Orwell's ideology, the ideological state apparatus of the writer, of the imaginative person, of the sensitive person uh, who is 
uh, betraying his own ideology in his mocking of this local half uh, Indian half Eurasian European officer. Okay, so Orwell is also implicated in this. Of course, he accepts that, but his writing of this essay in no way exonerates him. It in no way absolves him of the charges of colonial ideology. This is an ideology to work in another way. That's what you have to understand. Ideology is a performance. So the execution is the performance of the represent state apparatus and the writing of this essay and our reading of it is part of the ideological state apparatus. So even more horrible than that hanging is Orwell's writing of this essay, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Orwell himself disavowed this essay later, I guess. I'm not sure about this. Uh, several people laughed. At what nobody seems certain. People laugh for almost nothing. So they were all laughing. Francis was walking by the superintendent talking garrulously. He was very talkative and sociable all at once. The Francis, the South Indian officer, Francis, the South Indian superintendent, was uh, talking very uh, in a very friendly manner to the British superintendent. Well, sir, all has passed off with the utmost satisfactoriness. It was all finished, flick, like that. It is not always so. Oh, no. Have known cases where the doctor was obliged to go beneath the gallows and pull the prisoner's legs to ensure disease most disagreeable. This is gallows humor. So, the South Indian office, uh, officer was telling his superior that once upon a time, when they were hanging a poor man, he did not die after the liver had been pulled. So, the doctor had to go behind the bricks and pull his legs so that he would expire. So this is gallows humor. People were supposed to laugh at this. Wriggling about, ah, that's bad, said the superintendent. Was he wriggling? Was he writing? Oh, uh, oh sir, it is worse when they become refractory. Refractory means uh, not conducive, okay, obstructing, impeding. So he was not, in, uh, you know, uh, friendly. He was not helping them to carry out his own execution. Of course, nobody would be. Okay, so he was acting in an unfriendly manner. He was acting in a refractory manner. He was acting in a obstructing, in an obstructing manner, impeding manner, a refractory manner. One man, I recall, clung to the bars of his cage when we went to take him out. You will scarcely credit, sir, that it took six warders to dislodge him. Six people had to pull that man, one on each leg, three on each leg, so that he could be dislodged from the bars of his cage uh, onto which he was clutching. But no, he would not listen. Oh, he was very troublesome. So the South Indian warden is also made into a caricature by Orwell, which is supposed to reveal uh, the South Indian officer's ideology, but ultimately it tells us about the ideological state apparatus that is literature and that includes uh, the great George Orwell. I found that I was laughing quite loudly. To his astonishment, to his dismay, George Orwell found that he too was laughing. Everyone was laughing. After the hanging came the laughing. Even the superintendent grinned in a tolerant way. He was uh, doing this kind of illy grin. You would better all come out and have a drink. Come all of you. You all better come out and have a drink with me. He said quite generally. I have got a bottle of whiskey in the car. We could do with it. We went through the big double gates of the prison. The prison had huge iron gates. Or pulling out his legs. Uh, so, I'm sorry about the accent. So, a Burmese magistrate, a local magistrate, who in all probability had sentenced this man to death. Because uh, during that period in British India, this was a great reform that uh, native magistrates, native judges can also uh, function and pass orders on local populace. And the uh, Burmese magistrate chuckled. He emitted a loud chuckle. He chuckled. He laughed in a suppressed manner. We all began laughing again. They all started laughing again. At that moment, Francis' anecdote, the South Indian uh, jailer's anecdote, seemed so funny. It seemed like uh, the best dog they all had heard ever in their lives. We all had a drink together, raging and European alike, quite amicably. Like good old friends, they all came together and uh, had their whiskey. The dead man was a hundred yards away. He was hanging there. He was still hanging there. His body was still cold around uh, that time. At that time, uh, his body was still there. Okay, it was still hanging there. So, K. Sachidanandan, for instance, has this very beautiful poem called Kali Marathileke Pogandamandi Atmagadam. Ilagalekal Pookal Alla, Venilile Vagamaram Bole, Enikki Ormagalekal Sopnengal Undayirbu. Indalekal Velichamulla Uru Nale, Kathavarani Maranam Nita Vekya, Nyan Uru Shahar Saadhe Alla, Kathakalade Vrikshan Ilagoyinne Kali Marathileke Pogandamandi Atmagadam. 
അവസാനമായി എന്തെങ്കിലും ആഗ്രഹമുണ്ടോ എന്ന് പുലിനിരുന്ന് ചെവി ഉയർത്തുന്ന ഒരു മുയലാകണമെന്ന് മാവിൽ ചിലയ്ക്കുന്ന അണ്ണാനാകണമെന്ന് മഴവില്ലിന്റെ കിളിയും തലമുറകളുടെ പുഴയും പൂക്കാലത്തിന്റെ കാറ്റുമാകണമെന്ന് ഞാൻ പറഞ്ഞില്ല അവർ നൽകിയ മധുരത്തിന് മരണത്തിന് ചവർപ്പായിരുന്നു കഴിമരത്തെ അതിജീവിക്കുന്ന പൂച്ചയുടെ കണ്ണുകളല്ല കടും ചവർപ്പ് നിയമ നിർമ്മാതാക്കളെ പറയൂ പറയൂ വിധികർത്താക്കളെ പശ്ചാത്താപം പോലും അസാധ്യമാക്കുന്ന ഈ വിധിന്യായത്തിൽ നിങ്ങൾ പശ്ചാത്തപിക്കുന്നില്ലേ കൊലപാതകത്തിന്റെ ചൂടൻ യുക്തിയിൽ നിന്ന് തൂക്കിക്കൊലയുടെ തണുത്ത യുക്തിയിലേക്ക് എത്ര ദൂരമുണ്ട് ചോദ്യങ്ങൾ ഭൂമിയുടെ പച്ചയിൽ വിട്ട് ഞാൻ പോകുന്നു അപരാധികളും നിരപരാധികളും രക്തസാക്ഷികളും ഏറെ നടന്നു പോയ ചോരമൂടിയ ഇതേ വഴിയിലൂടെ നാളെയെങ്കിലും ഒരാൾക്കും ഈ വഴി വരേണ്ടതായിരിക്കേണ്ടതാകട്ടെ നാളെ ഉണ്ടാകട്ടെ സോ ലെറ്റ്സ് വൈറ്റ് വിത്ത് ദിസ് so please uh, please uh, delve deeply into the unconscious of repressed ideology that's functioning in this absolutely beautiful piece of literature by uh, George Orwell Eric Arthur Blair who was born in Motihari in Bengal in 1903 in British India